Welcome to 15 Minutes with Andy. So happy that you've chosen to spend a little time with us here as part of your day, whether it be morning, afternoon, evening, whenever you're tuned into this. We are having a ton of fun and also hearing about some great stories, and that's been our hope through all of this. Um, we want to have a little fun with, with some of the guests that we have and also... I mean, it's gonna. We hope that it's a broad range of emotions that you're kind of feeling as you're listening, whether they be uh, uh, emotions of hope or inspiration, or maybe just turning on the ability to learn something uh, in here. That's what we want. And I guess the biggest takeaway from every one of these podcasts, we hope, is uh, that we leave you with uh, some positivity in your world, because that's certainly what our angle is, is trying to turn, especially in some of our guests' uh, darkest hours into a very uh, positive uh, light now because of uh, the things that they're doing in their life and in their world and in our world and community as well. So that's the genesis and the basis for 15 Minutes with Andy. And again, it's 15 minutes of fame. If you're locking on here, we may have a podcast that ends up 15 minutes, but we haven't found anybody anybody that's sharing their stories in 15 minutes because we certainly don't want to censor anybody or, or hold back from that complete story. We want to get that full story out to everybody that's tuning into all of our podcasts. So that's where the 15 minutes of fame kind of play on words came in. We're very happy to be joined by Mary Juarez. Uh, who maybe some people that are listening know a little bit about Mary's background or story, or maybe this is going to be completely brand new to some people that tune in. Mary, first of all, thanks for giving of your time to me today and to our listeners to this podcast. Thanks to invite. For, thanks for inviting me, Mary. Um, I guess just let's start with you. Where where are you from? Give us a little background information on you. Okay, I was actually born in Cleveland and adopted out at the age of seven months. Went to Etcherton, um, went to St. Mary's Catholic School, raised in St. Mary's, raised on a farm. Um, Had a mom and dad that basically was very, very involved in my brother and I's lives. Um, Graduated from high school from Etcherton and went to work in a factory, ended up married, had three children, Christy, Marjo, and Ian. Uh, That marriage ended in divorce. Um, I worked in the factory at Fleetwood for many years building a camper and or building camper trailers and kind of I don't know just was trying to uh, get through life raising three children for a while and then I ended up remarrying and I married Victor and we are still married today we just celebrated 25 years well congratulations on that (laughs) 25 years in a marriage is certainly amazing especially in our times now uh before even never let go had to become a reality which we'll dive into you already i mean that first part of what you told uh, us right now is uh, a story in itself isn't it in the fact that you uh, were in cleveland and an adopted child i'm sure that's been an emotional journey for you and just in that yeah i that would be a whole story in itself um i actually had no no desire to find my biological mother. Um, I was very, very happy. Mom and dad, my adopted mom and dad, Cletus and Virginia Cape was to me, my mom and dad. And then when I turned 40, I watched a movie on TV and something happened. It was something about someone giving up for adoption. So I started looking for my biological mother and I found her. She was in Florida. And I had someone actually hear from Brian contact her, and she wanted nothing to do with meeting me. But five years later, I met two biological brothers who um, her and her husband raised after she had given me up. So I have two brothers that I keep in touch with now. Boy, there's an ultimate negative, isn't it, that in your world that turned into something good, right? Yeah, and... um, my hope was I always wanted to meet her and thank her for the gift of my life. Um, my adopted mom, who to me was my real mom, she was actually buried on my biological mother's birthday. Oh, wow. Which I thought was ironic. And so after I lost my mom in 93, my dream was really just to meet this woman. Her name was Connie. And just say, thank you for the gift of my life. You gave me everything. You you gave me all the love you could by 
giving me a better life than what you were going to be able to. And that dream died a year and a half ago in March during COVID. She passed away. And she had never agreed to meet me. Mm-hmm. Was, uh, was there? Did you go through like the emotions of anger and bitterness because of that before you were able to get I, to that? Yeah, point? I was mad at her because yeah. I kept thinking all I want to do is thank you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to harm your life. I'm not trying to bring up stuff that you're not ready to deal with. I just want to thank you. And I was never given that opportunity. So, what was life for you <laughs> in Edgerton like when you? I mean, you're coming from first of all a an urban area in Cleveland and and now in Edgerton, Ohio, and you've mentioned your adoptive parents and family, and you know what it's like around here. Certainly everybody feels like family, don't they, once, yeah. you, once you meet everybody, not just capes, but everybody in and around Edgerton. What was that like? Well, when I left Cleveland, I was only seven months. So, But now that my daughter lives in Buffalo and we're going through Cleveland to get to Buffalo, it's kind of strange because the first time I went through there, my heart kind of pitter-pattered. And I'm kind of like, wow, this is my birth home. Mm-hmm. This is where I would have been. And then I started thinking about it, and I thought, who would I have been? I was actually, my birth name was Denise Louise. That's what I was named at birth. And then when the adoption took place, Mom and Dad renamed me Mary Catherine. So... You know, wondering, driving through Cleveland the first time, I was like, who would Denise Louise have been? What would I have done with my life? Would I have been married? Would I have had children? Would I have been a business lady? Instead of working in a factory building campers, you know, being raised on a farm and falling in love with the cows and the pigs, and, you know, I wouldn't have been Mary. So it was very bittersweet meeting my brothers but then it was really hard to know that she never gave in to wanting to meet me. Mm. And I'm okay with that now. Um, when she died during COVID, my brothers had told me actually that I could go down and visit her. She was in a nursing home. She had dementia. And they said, you know, she won't know you. You know, you can come down and at least you will get to meet her. But I wanted... I only wanted to meet her under her conditions. If she was ready, I was ready. I would have hopped on a plane, even though I don't like traveling. But she never got to that point. And I didn't want to bring her any more pain than what she had probably already gone through giving me up. So, Is, there a, is it still a good relationship, at least with your brothers? Yes, we, we get along great. In fact, the first phone call, I felt horrible because I called John, who is two years younger than me, and I started asking him if he knew... You know, and I mentioned their names, and he's like, yeah, those are my parents. And I'm like, well, I have reason to believe that I'm your sister. And he goes, well, that's not possible because my mom and dad only have my brother and I. And I said, I know, and his names. And I mentioned his name, and he's like, how did you know that? (laughs) I said, because I'm finding out a lot about your family because your mother's name is on my birth certificate. And What was that like for them? Well, he he was in shock. I mean, you know, he was... Okay, how old would I have been back then? 45, so he would have been 41. No, he would have been 43 when he found that out. And the youngest one would have been 41. So yeah, when you think you're, their mom and dad ended up divorced. But um, we are pretty sure that their father is the one that fathered me too. Except she was a single girl at that time and he was a married man and it was just, this was a way long time ago when stuff like that wasn't accepted. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, I got a story with my two brothers, and we keep in touch all the time, and, and uh, I love them. I mean, I love them. They're my own. I mean, you know, they're part of my blood. So, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, and, again, that's the ultimate of what could have been the worst situation at that time in your life turned into something positive. I mean, you could still be an angry person right now about what your mom didn't do or didn't want, but how did you, I guess, how did you let that go? There wasn't anything to really let go, I don't think, because I had, you know, if I would have had a different kind of life, excuse me, maybe I would have looked at it differently, but I had two beautiful parents. So, and when I lost... My, when my biological mother passed away, I just kept thinking of mom and dad meeting her at heaven. 
and saying thanks for giving us our Mary all them years. Yeah. And someday, hopefully, I'm going to make it to heaven and I'm going to be able to give her a hug and say, you gave me the greatest gift ever. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm very pro-life. I, how can I not be? Oh. You know, very pro-life and totally you know, get very that. pro-adoption because, I don't know, there's a reason for every child. I was, it was a very difficult circumstance for her from what I have learned and but she made something beautiful out of it she wasn't ready she couldn't be a single mom back then it wouldn't have worked but she that unselfish love you know just christ has that same unselfish love for us and she had that for me enough to give me away and i think that's the reason why <clears throat> excuse me she never wanted to meet me was because she felt the guilt probably yeah i don't know so uh, you mentioned um, your your um, life had gotten you had when you met Victor and got remarried. Obviously, life took a turn for the better there because any I mean I'm a divorced person as well. That's a bad situation for for all parties involved. And eventually, you find you hope to find happiness on the other side. Um, but, but you mentioned you had three children. Yes. So we're here, obviously, to talk about Never Let Go Ministries. So we know something has happened. So did, did you, as mom, see what was going on with Marjo <clears throat> leading up to the time in 2010? And I guess tell us that story of where that began and, and where, where Never Let Go began. Okay. Well, my mother passed away um, in November, November 8th, actually my daughter's 19th birthday, and was buried on November 11th, 93 my biological mother's birthday, I had learned. And Marjo, uh, Chrissy had just went to college. Marjo entered his freshman year of high school in Atchison, and Ian is two years behind him. And they were very close. All my children are very close to mom and dad. I mean, Grandma Jenny and Grandpa Heine were the world to them. They were, I think they're safe haven when their dad and I, you know, during the years of the marriage that weren't so good and the hollering and, you know, grandma and grandpa's house was always open. And the night that she passed, I came home and I, my, the boys were sitting at the table doing homework. And I told them that they, the first thing they said was, how's grandma doing? And I said, she passed away. I said, the angels came and took her tonight. And I can still remember Marjo running up the stairs and slamming his bedroom door so hard that I thought he was going to break every window in the house. He was 14. He'd never been through any grief like that. We had, we had never lost, we had lost, he had lost his uncle years before that, but he was very young. And looking back now, my mom was my best friend. I mean, she was my world to me. And I was so much in grief that I don't even you know, I kept saying, are you guys doing okay? Are you doing okay? And of course, Christy was in Toledo at college. So I wasn't there to physically be able to hold her and give her comfort. But I think that I was so much in grief myself that I lost track of maybe the boys. And of course, 14 years old, these guys are not going to sit around and cry. Yeah, I miss my grandma. And my words of advice to anybody, whether you're 10 years old or 18 years old, this old thing that society used to say, big boys don't cry, I hate that saying, because men need to cry, boys need to cry. And I look back now and I wonder what would have happened if maybe I would have gotten him into counseling and if maybe he could have gotten some of that pain out. And three months, after my mom died, I caught him with a group of new friends. He had been drinking. He was actually very, very intoxicated that night. And I was adopted. So at that time, I didn't know anything about my genetics. My ex-husband's side of the family, they did have some addiction in their family. And so not ever knowing what is in our genetic bloodline, you know, you're taking a risk at using, abusing, experimenting early. And Marjo did just that. So my fear, he's 14, he's already started drinking, oh my goodness. So I was already afraid that something could happen. And, you know, when he started just coming home later, you know, it caused a lot of problems with Victor and I. And pretty much disrupted the whole household. And, you know, I, I got him into counseling as far as the drinking went. Uh, although he said that 
all the kids drank and it wasn't that big a deal, which they still say these days, but it is a big deal. And he, w he would say to me, well, all I'm doing is drinking a little bit of beer. It's not going to kill me. But Andy, in the end, it did. And these young adults now think that drinking beer is okay. There's some parents that think it's okay if the children drink at their house because they're okay there, but it's not okay. And so that drinking at the age of 14 turned into eventually smoking marijuana. And he did graduate from, from Etcherton High School, which I was very thankful he did, but he was starting to get very discouraged about everything. And I could tell that he was giving up hope. He was a very good looking kid. He was very smart. He had a very close relationship with Jesus. Went to church all the time. We read Bible stories the whole time he was growing up. And then all of a sudden this cute little kid that used to run track and play ball and be the life of the party as far as, you know, doing goofy stuff in front of the camera. All of a sudden he's this six foot four man with the most discouraged look in his eyes ever that never wanted his picture taken, never wanted to be around anybody, never wanted to talk about anything. And so we watched that for several years and he ended up coming to me one day. I was at, actually in the parking lot at Fleetwood getting ready to go into work. I was praying my morning prayers and he came and knocked on my window and he was living in Auburn, Indiana at the time. And, um, he knocked on the window and he said, I need to talk to you, Mom. And I'm like, 6.30 in the morning, Margil's here to talk to me about what? And he told me he was using heroin and he needed help. So we got him into a place in Toledo called Compass. He stayed there for about two weeks, decided he was good to go. And then he made the major decision to move down uh, to Indiana area, about four hours away, down by where his father lived. And... You know, I was trying to tell him because he said, I got to get away from everybody in this area. And I hear a lot of people in recovery say that now. But I remember saying to him, Marjo, there's going to be drugs everywhere you go. You have to learn how to be strong enough to say no. You have to, you have to pray for the courage to be able to say no. Because no matter where you run, there's always going to be some. I know, I know, but I just got to get out of here. So he moved away and he fathered a little boy down there. Um, him and his girlfriend had, I think, an okay relationship. I think it was a little rocky. But um, we'd see improvements, but then, you know, he'd call and then he'd be right back. And it was just back and forth and back and forth. And I never knew when the phone rang whether it was going to be a good phone call. Hey, Mom, how you doing? I love you. I miss you. Or whether it was going to be just everything negative. That, that had to be, I mean, I'm a dad too and thinking about that had to be the most helpless powerless feeling to go through it was we had on our powerpoint i have a, p a picture of a piece of paper and it's from 2003 and it was one of them very long conversations over the phone with him this would have been about a year after he told me about his heroin use and on the phone that day you know he's four hours away and i'm in edgerton and he said, I'm sorry for every time I made you cry. And because I would just look at him and I'd say, what's, you know, what are you doing? And he'd say, Mom, you don't understand. And I'm like, well, no, I don't understand. You've got everything going for you. But those words were so important. And, and I know so many people, we've met some amazing people in recovery. And they all say, well, I'm never going to be able to be forgiven. And nobody's ever going to forget all the stuff I've done. And I'm like... Marjo wrote, I'm sorry for every time I made you cry. I said, you could have handed me a million dollars or those words, and I would have taken those words. I literally wrote them on a piece of scrap paper, and I put them. <sighs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I put them in my china cabinet. That's okay. As a reminder that he was sorry, because I often wondered how he could do some of the things he did and not be sorry. But those, those words were like gold to me. And so after we lost him, I pulled that piece of paper out, and which I did several times because I always wanted that reminder that he did tell me he was sorry, and that meant everything. So I pulled him out, and I took a picture of him, and it's on our PowerPoint today, to tell these children, to tell these 
adults to tell these men and women who are in recovery now that yes, you can apologize and those words will mean something. And yes, it may take years before they're trusted again because it does, it take, it's a long journey, you know, it really is. But 2010 was the year you lost him, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so I just, again, I can't imagine, uh, you and I have talked about this story a lot through the years with, with Never Let Go was yeah. uh, the Blizzard auction recipient, if people are listening, and, and maybe that's where they heard of your organization. But I'm sure on that day, and I'll let you share the date, that Never Let Go Ministries or any kind of, I don't know, help situation was probably the farthest from your mind, I guess. Tell me a little bit about, and our listeners a little bit about, what uh, 2010 and, and from there. Well... So, yeah, he moved back here. We went down and got him in 2009. He actually had overdosed in Indiana, uh, had a little boy, three years old at the time. We went down, Victor and I went down, picked him up and brought him back here, got him into the Salvation Army Rehabilitation Center in Fort Wayne, went through eight months of rehab, extensive rehab, gave his life back to the Lord, joined a church team, um, had his second child on the way. Things were Um, looking up. Yes, things were very much looking up, and he had um, gotten back with an old girlfriend here that he had been with years prior to that, and he was really excited about sobriety, and he was so focused on his recovery. He graduated January 17, 2010 from Salvation Army, and he stood up there and he said, if you think positive, positive things will happen. If you think negative, negative things will happen, and he was so focused that day. Him and his girlfriend moved to Montpelier, he couldn't find a job. Um, unbelievably, 11 years ago right now, there was no job anywhere in Williams County. Uh, unemployment rate was 14% when he had graduated. He couldn't find a job. He was getting discouraged. And I think it was just one of them situations where temptation came knocking at the door, and uh, he opened up the door and uh, decided to get high one more time, and maybe nobody would ever find out about it. But that choice to get high one more time ended up being the last time. His birthday was April 16th. He turned 31 and we had a little birthday party for him. I baked his chocolate cake and we had a party for him at his little brother's house in Blakesley and I could tell that night that he was either using, thinking about it, whatever, because he was very irritable again. He was very discouraged again. His smile was gone. His eyes looked just depressed. He just, he was just not in a good frame of mind. And I, you know, whenever people in recovery get stressed out, that's the first thing I think that crosses their mind is if you get high, you're not going to have to think about for, you know, a few hours. And so I had to work on that Saturday and I wanted to go do an intervention with him again, but I was, I was mad, but I was also unsure of how to handle it because what if he really wasn't using, what if he was just stressed out over having a baby on the way and couldn't find a job, etc. And so I was, it's kind of like walking around on eggshells when you're, when you're around someone in addiction, because you never know what might push them off the end or what might bring them closer. And so I never went over there after I got off work that day. Victor and I went to church that night when I came home. I talked to him on the phone, and he ended up passing out on me. I was giving him this pep talk. He said, Mom, i got to get a job. And and I said, what are you doing tonight? Because I knew he was high or something, and he tried to convince me he was drinking, and I knew better. And so the next morning, or that, Victor went over to the apartment and ended up coming home, and, and they couldn't find anything. He was sleeping. They said, you know, we'll let him sleep. So uh, 4.15, the phone rang, and uh, we ended up uh, being in the Montpelier Hospital. And uh, it was shortly, it was uh, 5.16 when he was pronounced dead. I heard the ER door open, and I saw a guy walking out with scrubs on, and I still don't know this day what he said. I just knew that. Marja was gone, so I got to spend about four hours with him that day. And uh, Todd Buttermore was a nurse on call, which I didn't know who he was at that time. I found out a year later. But um, a year after that, 
he asked me, we got to meet in person because I wanted to thank him for everything he did for us that morning because if it wouldn't have been for him, I don't know how we would have gotten through it. And he said, do you remember what you said to me before I went off my shift? And I said, no. And he said, you pointed your finger in my face and you said, this is not going to be the end of my son's story. And when he told me that, I had chills because obviously God planted that seed for Never Let Go Ministries that morning at 5, 16 a.m. when my son was pronounced dead. And six months later, I went to St. Mary's School to talk to the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders about the dangers of alcohol and drug use, put some pictures on a board of Marjo, and just went over there and shared the story. Cried through probably most of it. But the fear and the tears of those little children made me realize it, that it, those tears just touched my heart. And I went home and I told Victor, I said, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. He's like, what? And I said, telling Marjo's story. And I had gotten permission from my daughter and from my other son about talking about Marjo's story because, of course, when he died, everybody's like, well, what happened? Well, what happened? Well, unfortunately, today, I mean, you know, if there's a needle there and they test it and there's fentanyl or whatever, they know what they died from. But back then, there was no evidence anywhere. So we had to wait on the, you know, toxicology, autopsy reports. Um, my mother's heart inside of me knew that it was going to be an overdose. But until the coroner called us into the office and read it, I still had a little bit of hope that maybe just something crazy happened, you know, maybe just something natural happened. But so at that time in 2010, we did not talk about drug overdoses. We did not talk about drugs in our county. It was kind of hush-hush, and nobody did want to talk about it. Nobody wanted our county's reputations, our country itself ruined because of drugs. And I, I just kept praying about it, and I kept praying about it, and I kept thinking, you know, we, I don't want to sweep his death under the rug. I want to, I'm want i not I'm not ashamed of my son. I never was. He was amazing. He was absolutely, he would have given you the shirt off his back. But his years of addiction changed him. But I wanted people to know that he did die of drugs. If I would have known, absolutely positively sure, had the toxicology report in my hand when I wrote his obituary, the first line would have been Marjo James Gentleman, 31 of Montpelier at the time, died from a drug overdose. Because... People need to know that this is happening every day and every day and every day. And the more we don't talk about it, the worse it gets. And, you know, there's just, he wanted to come out with his story. He joined the men's team at church. And the day that he died was actually the day that he was going to a meeting to discern, to give that witness the next year. But he wanted to talk about his addiction. He wanted to write a book called 15 Years in Hell or From Darkness to Light. And... I actually, we talked about it before he passed, and I'm like, you know what? I went through all them years with you, buddy. I said, I think I ought to get my two cents in as my, you know, as the mom that went through this with you. So we had actually decided that maybe we would call it a son's addictions, a mother's prayers, and then 15 years in hell from, from darkness to light as a subtitle. And um, the first year of his anniversary date of losing him, I wrote the first chapter. In the second year, I wrote the second chapter, and I, I'm only on chapter five right now. But Marjo basically had already made that decision to come out with his story. So I think that in itself gave me the approval, and I knew that's what I needed to do. So spoke to them, St. Mary's children, and before we knew it, we were speaking in another church, and we were speaking in another group, and my passion then was we got to get out there and warn all these kids. You know, you can't drink, you can't drink, you can't drink. Uh, we started going to Columbus to drug conferences up there, and the professionals up there say you shouldn't even drink before you're 25 because your brain is still not fully developed, and especially if there's addiction in your family, which a lot of these people don't know, these young adults. So... Um, you know, my passion was for the children, but then we started talking to people in recovery, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, they're all Marjos. You know, they're all in that space where they're just lost right now, and they need somebody to pat them on the back and tell them they can, you know, they can make it. And then I had people reaching out to me saying, so-and-so lost her son. You know, I think it was an overdose. Could you reach out to her? Well, I didn't have another mom to talk to when I died, or, you know, when Marjo mm -hmm. died. 
I didn't have another mother to convince me that I was going to make it. So then, I don't know, Andy, it just kind of hopped from one category to another, one passion to another. Was everybody family-wise on board with what you wanted to do? Yes. Okay. I mean, yeah. And and Christy, and, you know, I talked it over with Victor, and I talked it over with Christy and Ian, my son and daughter, and they're like, you know, Marjo wanted to. They said, you know, if that's what you want to do, go ahead and do it. And there was people that I, there's a lady that rode the school bus with me. She was just a few years older than I am. <clears throat> and she came up to me after hearing one of our talks. And I was always kind of like her little sister. And she'd say, Mary, 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 I don't think you ought to be doing this. And I said, why? And she goes, because every, every time that wound gets healed, you're going to rip that Band-Aid off by talking again. And I remember saying to her, you know what, if this saves another family from going through what we've gone through, I don't care. And it just, and then a year after Marjo died on his birthday, April 16th, 2011, was my first day off of work. I quit my full-time job to start the ministry. And I spoke at a breast cancer luncheon, actually at the Wesley United Methodist Church in Bryan that day, telling a little bit about Marjo's story. And then in 2014, um, a beautiful woman came forward and did our 501c3 for us. And, you know, we became a legal nonprofit. So. And now it's, I mean, Never Let Go Ministries, your, your borders are beyond Edgerton, beyond Williams County, and beyond just schools now. And, and you, like you said, you're going into recovery centers. And, and I guess what's the ultimate goal of all of this in the end what's the end goal well i don't know i hope i live long enough to put i don't know how many houses of hope because so many people i'm sorry no. just like marjo okay. It's okay. he got out of rehab he was so focused he was so ready to get out there so positive that he was going to make it this time but then you get out there and, you know, these these people right now, like, I just, I check CCNO all the time. I write a lot of letters to the guys and the girls and women in rehab and in prisons. And, you know, I'll go in CCNO and think, oh, you know, so-and-so, I, I know they're not going to be on here because they're doing good. And then the next thing I know, they're this, their name again. And my heart just sinks. And I'm like, how did it happen again? But they get out and a lot of times the relationships have been severed with family members and so the old friends show up which were the ones that partied with them to begin with and there's no place for this napoleon does have one uh, but there's no place right here in this area for a house of hope where they can go and just stay there to get maybe another six months focused in their sobriety because so many times, and, you know, because of insurance and all of that, a lot of times these fundings have been cut for a lot of these programs, too. So, you know, what might have been a 90-day program five years ago might be a 40-day program now, 30-day program. So I think what I, you – your organization always spoke to me from the beginning because I grew up with a mother that ended up – we thought we were going to get the call. There were many times we went over and she was, she was, we were kind of estranged then and she had passed out from, from, they were more prescription drugs than mm -hmm. anything else, but she was over medicating and shouldn't, and she had a drug addiction problem. She had an alcohol problem. It just never, it just never got any better. So I think your story, she didn't die of that. It ended up being a health issue, but probably brought on by Cost. all of the years of drug abuse and and alcohol abuse. So when you and I first met, while I didn't have the ending to the story, I thought I could have had that ending to the story. And I'm with you 100% when what you say is, and this was in the 90s mm -hmm. for a lot of times and even farther back. And now we're in, even in 2010, when you said that this your organization was founded and nobody wanted to talk about it, whether it's mental health, whether it's drug yeah. and alcohol addiction, whatever it might be, it is long, long past time that we hide and don't talk. And how do you deal with something like that? Is it better? Are you finding that experience better now? Are we more of an open forum or an open book now? Is it better? 
I think it's better. And I want to backtrack one second because Marjo did die. I forgot to mention he did die from prescription drugs. And um, it was someone else's prescriptions. You know, he didn't have any in his name. But do I think it's better now? <sighs> there's times, Andy, where I think we've made 50,000 steps forward. And then there's times, like even on Facebook, I've read comments like, well, so-and-so died, but that was their choice. And, you know. We victim shame. Yeah. And every solid person that we have met in addiction. And like I said, I think Marjo's first wound came from the loss of his grandma. I think that I think that literally burned a hole in his heart, and he didn't know how to heal that. And we've met some <clears throat> amazing people in recovery, and they've all got they, there seems to be a hole in every one of them's heart and soul from whatever. It could have been a relationship, it could have been a loss of job, it could have been anything, and. You know, it used to be people used to shun the addicts. Well, you know, they were raised, you know, they were living under a bridge, they're homeless, whatever. You can be a doctor, nurse, you can be a lawyer, you can be a pastor. Addiction has affected everyone. And, you know, you asked me if it changed, and, and I just had this conversation with somebody yesterday. I remember at the Bryan Industry Show years ago when we would have our booth there, and people would stop and they would say, well, now what's this all about? And I would say, well, my son died from an overdose in 2010 and we've got plenty of literature here. And they're like, well, I don't have anybody in my family that does stuff like that. And they would walk on. And my heart would just, I, I remember that same exact conversation did happen. And I turned around to the lady that was helping me and I looked at her and I said, Mary, I really hope that they're right. I hope nobody in their family is doing it. But now it seems like, since we're busy with the cruise in now and we're going to a lot of car shows handing out our flyers and every time now we stop and say well here's a brochure about our organization and they'll look at the picture of me on at my son's grave and they're like what's this and I said I lost a son to addiction and just last week alone we went one place to hand out flyers and we ended up in three very very heavy conversations about addiction well, I'm recovering from heroin right now. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, how long? You know, and they're like five years. And I'm giving this guy a hug. You know, I'm like so proud of him. And, you know, we met a man recently who lost a mother and a sister to addiction in recent months. And now it's like as soon as we say I lost a son to addiction, we're a ministry. We're trying to reach out to those who have been affected by drugs and alcohol and that door opens, then they feel safe to be able to talk about it. And I think in that aspect, it has gotten better because it's opened the door. And But do I still think there's a lot of things that, like I went on the website uh, to find out for the parade, I was doing new stat sheets, and oh, Williams County had, I think it was seven drug overdose deaths in 2020. And I personally think there was a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of different codes that they use, and there's a lot of different channels that they have to follow, et cetera. But I still think there's a lot of people that don't think it's that bad in this area. I, I still think we need to continue to work and work and work at raising awareness. 2020 escalated. Uh, we had on our PowerPoint a picture of a football field that, that holds 73,000, 72,000, I think it was that year. And we had that on our PowerPoint, and it said last year, which would have been referring to 2017, this is how many people died from addiction, you know, in the United States. And then this, just this last summer, I'm going into the CDC and Ohio Department of Health and, and um, NIDA and several places, and they're estimating right now at the least amount that died in 2020 would have been 93,300 from addiction. That's not to mention the additional 80-some thousand that were killed in alcoholic crashes, alcohol-related deaths. Suicides have skyrocketed since then. So 2020 was really hard on that community because, you know, they couldn't get in to see their appointments. They couldn't get the help. And they became very discouraged and very despondent, you know. And they 
if you don't have hope, and I've said it a million times, if you don't have hope, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. So, Anybody listening right now, there's somebody that's in some despair or they know somebody that is in the throes of addiction. What would you encourage them to do? Reach out reach out. I, you know, we've even got so many people in recovery that will be willing to talk to somebody who needs to get in recovery, you know, and um, just reach out and admit that you need help. Because right now, our county, from what we have been hearing, is got a lot of fentanyl in it. And fentanyl is not that type of stuff that you're going to do for how many years. Like my son, basically, between the heroin and the prescription pills, you know, from beginning to end, basically had a 15-year addiction. But the stuff that are out there right now, you could die just like that. And they're lacing fentanyl in so many things. I've got a, a mother right now who is coming up on her son's anniversary date. He took one Xanax and found out that it was laced. I mean, he, he ended up losing his life. And he was not in addiction, but he took a Xanax to try to get a good night's sleep. So out there if you're using right now or even these young kids that think that they can experiment with something it's deadly you know i i asked a young man recently in my office he came to see me and i said would you play russian roulette and he said well that'd be pretty stupid and i said well you're playing it every time you go out there and get high again because with the fentanyl you don't know and so i think the biggest thing is if if you're struggling if you're scared that somebody's if you're too scared to reach out and get help, just pray for the courage. Because if you don't get help, you might end up not getting another chance. And there are people that do care. You know, we've got plenty of links to different services in this area and beyond this area that, you know, if they don't want to go to rehab in the local area, you know, we've got a list of places otherwise, too. So some people are just ashamed. But don't be ashamed. Just, you know, know that you can have a new life. You know, it can happen. Don't give up on that. You have an event that you would want to make mention of that's coming up in Edgerton. By the time this airs, it's going to be, I think, on that coming Saturday, but it's on October 9th. What, what's happening and what's Never Let Go doing? Okay, well, we have had, this will be the 11th cruise in that we've had and it is in downtown Etcherton in the park area right down in Etcherton and um, everybody brings their classic cars motorcycles trucks and cruises in we and you also, mean the downtown park I don't mean to interrupt right yeah not at Miller Park not at Miller Park okay. yep the downtown park right across from the bank where the fire hall used to be and well that part of the fire hall is still there and um, so we have a big raffle ticket. We um, raffle off a 55-inch flat-screen TV, and there's several. Testament Tattoo gave us a $100 gift certificate. We got several prizes on that, and we're selling tickets for that, $10 a piece or three for 20 So we'll be raffling that off. We will also have another raffle table there. Uh, we give out trophies. There is no registration fee for the cruise in. Just come in and register, get your car. It's from 10 until 2 o'clock, and the canine unit, as far as I know, is going to still be able to make it, and they will do a demonstration, which they do a phenomenal job. They're there every year, and, you know, a lot of people have never seen the, you know, the dogs do, you know, go after the drugs, and it's really interesting to see these dogs and, and their trainers, you know, so we're really looking forward to that. They, they've done it, I think, almost every solid year, and we love having them, and uh, so then we also took on the Fall Fest this year because the Edgerton Chamber was not going to be able to do it, so we had a um, young lady come forward to say she would help out with that part of it, so I'm I'm working on my own end like I usually do, and then uh, her and Victor are working on the Fall Fest part, and we're looking for vendors. We have vendors coming in, selling their products, you know, or their crafts or whatever, so we still have some vendor spots open. If they're interested, they could get a hold of us also. And that uh, your office is in downtown Edgerton, right? Okay, so we just moved okay. in May. We lost the office downtown. They sold the building, so we are now in top of the Village Hall mm -hmm. where they go in and pay their light bills. We are on the second floor in room 331. Ironically, Marjo was 31 when he passed. And I was devastated when we found out the building sold and I was not wanting the, 
stopped liking the idea of moving, but um, it's a it's we got a beautiful office up there. We really like it. I do want to make a warning though because I had a young man that came and finally coaxed him into coming up and just talking to me about getting into rehab. And he messaged me. I, he was like five minutes late, and he said, "There's police cars down here. I'm not coming in here." And I messaged him back, and I'm like, they're not here for you. He said they've got their office in the same building. Mm -hmm. So I just want to clarify that, that if you do come to see us at Never Let Go Ministries, the policemen have their station there, too, but they're on the bottom floor. You know, we don't even run into them. So mm -hmm. we're upstairs pretty much by ourselves right now. Okay. Good to know. Uh, I got a few questions. I call it speed round, but you don't have to answer in two seconds if you're willing to play with me here. That just right. kept me. By the way, you did a phenomenal job, Mary. I mean, oh, I don't know you. why you you just don't like <laughs> this part of it right I here. Don't. You get in front of people for people that are listening. She's always nervous when she comes to talk <laughs> to am. us, but always do a great job, a phenomenal job. Um, first question: What's your favorite word? Hope. What's your least favorite word? Despair. Sound or noise that you love. The sound of water, like mm -hmm. a river, lake. Very calming? Yeah, yeah, calming. Sound or noise that you hate? Oh, boy, that's a toughie. How many seconds do I have? Uh, as many as you Sirens, know. because that always means that somebody's Something hurt, bad. somebody needs help. Uh, what profession, other than this, which you're doing an amazing job at, but what profession have you always wanted to attempt? I used to... When I went to school, I always wanted to be a secretary, but in the back of my mind, I always thought it would be so awesome to go to college and be a psychiatrist, psychologist, because I'm one of these curious people from the time I was little. My mom used to tell me all the time, Mary Catherine, curiosity killed the cat. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to live that long then, because I was always curious as to why everybody did what they did. And now that I'm doing what I'm doing and meeting so many people, now I know that that curiosity has just made that passion grow all the more. Last one. How would you like to be remembered? Wow, that's tough. I guess just somebody that tried to share the gift of God's love and hope to, to the world. That's a good way. That's, I can't think of a better way. That's, that's a great way. God bless you for everything that you're doing. I, I, I said that this was our goal of this conversation that we do on a regular basis. This podcast was to maybe bring some people some hope and positivity. And I know that it's not easy going. You've told this story I'm probably literally thousands of times now, and I, it never gets easier. I know that. So thank you for sharing it with our listeners. Cause, and if we save one person that's listening right now or they know somebody, isn't it, I mean, it's always worth it. I, I, I got to believe for you, right? And there's so many people out there that we have seen recover. And we've got actually a young lady on our board of directors, and she is – doing fabulous. She just bought a house. She's got her children. So recovery is possible. Recovery is beautiful, but never let go of the hope in your heart that it can happen. Yeah. And be willing to take just that first step, right? Yeah. Just the that. first step, because if you don't take the first step, you may never get another chance to take that first step. And I, and I, you know, I've like the young man in the office, he was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to get it together. And I said, well, don't think like that. Think I can get it together. I can change my train of thought. And, you know, I struggle with getting depressed. I mean, I think everybody battles with, you know, is this ever going to work out? You know, I'm getting stressed out about this or that. You know, this world is not carefree. You know, it's never going to be. But the whole thing is just reaching out and trying to find the hope that's going to keep your flame lit. Boy, you mentioned the word. It sure can be. I know it's ugly at times, but it sure can be a beautiful place still, can it? Yes, it can be. And there's, like I said, recovery is, is definitely possible. And, you know, I know a lot of the people in recovery or the ones that aren't in recovery yet think that nobody cares about them. But I could, you come to the cruise in and you're going to find a lot of people that yeah. care about people in recovery because we know a lot of people 
that will do anything for these people to try to help them get on the right, you know, on the right path. So never let go of God's hand and never let go of the hope in your heart. Mary, thanks for taking the time being with us here today. Always a pleasure visiting with you. Thank you so much, Andy. As much as I, yeah, was nervous as heck when I walked in. (laughs) You know how I am with the microphone. I know. You did amazing. Thank you so very much for the opportunity. And you're doing amazing work every single day. People that are listening, please feel free to reach out and just ask for help, whether it's for you or for somebody that you know, care about, and love. Thanks for listening to 15 Minutes with Andy and 15 Minutes of, uh, I guess this is kind of fame. I don't know. (laughs) With Mary Juarez, she does an amazing job doing her and her entire family and that board doing amazing work with Never Let Go Ministries. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to 15 Minutes with Andy this time.